السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده سبحانه وتعالى حمد المعترفين بنعمائه العظيمة وآلائه الجسيمة اللهم لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك جل وجهك وعز جاهك تفعل ما تشاء بقدرتك لك العتبة حتى ترضى ولا حول ولا قوة لنا إلا بك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدًا عبد الله ورسوله صفيه من خلقه وحبيبه أرسله ربه بالهدى ودين الحق بشيرًا ونذيرًا وداعيًا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجًا منيرًا ففتح الله به أعيناً عميًا وآذاناً صمًا وقلوباً غلفًا وكان رحمة للعالمين وحجة على الناس أجمعين اللهم صل وسلم وزد وزد وبارك على الحبيب المصطفى محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه ومن اهتدى بهديه وعمل بسنته إلى يوم الدين وارض اللهم عنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك أرحم الراحمين اللهم آمين I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Lord of the universe the creator, the sustainer, the cherisher I thank Allah for the endless blessings that he has bestowed upon each and every one of us and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us worthy of his blessings, I bear witness that there's no deity worthy of worship save Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is Allah's final prophet and messenger, the bearer of glad tidings, carrier of the torch of light, the role model, the inspiration, Allah's favor upon humanity, the best human being that ever walked the face of this earth. I thank Allah for the favor of Muhammad. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us strength to always walk steadily in the footsteps of the Prophet ﷺ. And I ask Allah to extend His blessings to the Prophet's family and his descendants, to the Prophet's companions and their followers and all the men and women that walk in their footsteps. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to include us and our loved ones among them. Allahumma ameen. My dear brothers and sisters, I greet you with the greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to share with you a story that happened recently. We took uh, some of our students, you know, the students of the Wadith program who are studying to become Imams, all nine of them, in order to visit a scholar in the Bay Area. And I don't want to mention the name of the scholar just for privacy, even though you probably know who he is. Uh, and we spent the entire day with him. And uh, he was talking to us about all kinds of things, and we asked him all kinds of questions. And by the way, you know, if you've never experienced the idea of pursuing sacred knowledge, and traveling a distance to pursue sacred knowledge, you're missing a lot. Uh, you know, how should I put this? You know, imagine yourself taking a path, and at the end of this path is Jannah itself. You know, the Prophet ﷺ taught us in the hadith, مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِتُ فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَهَرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِهِ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ 
whoever pursues a path uh, for which he wants to uh, acquire knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will facilitate his path towards Jannah. This is exactly how we felt. So one of the things that this particular scholar was telling us is that he told us a story of a, of a Chinese family in the Bay Area, right? Uh, a Chinese family, the father moved to, to the Bay Area in the 1960s. Uh, and, you know, these are, these are Han Chinese people. These are the Chinese Chinese, right? They're not the Uyghur Chinese, right? So they're from the, from the eastern parts of China. And Islam has been in their family for about a thousand years. And so the father is an engineer, moved to the Bay Area, worked in the Silicon Valley. And that was his job, that was his career. But he dedicated his life to a different cause, to something else. He had a project, he had a mission in mind, and that is to translate seminal Islamic works from Arabic or English to the Chinese, to Mandarin, to Mandarin Chinese, right? He spent his entire life translating books. Uh, you know, many of them got published, Some, many of them did not get published. And so the father passed away. His son, who was born and raised in California, uh, is now this very unique Muslim of, of Chinese descent, who was an engineer in the Silicon Valley. Uh, and, and he asked himself, what did I inherit from my dad? Did I inherit the career, the engineering career? You don't inherit careers, right? That's not a legacy. That's just a job. You feed your kids. You know, a legacy is something beyond that. So he asked himself, what, what can I inherit from my father? And he inherited that legacy of translation from his father. And he asked himself, uh, what do I need to translate to the Mandarin Chinese language that my father did not translate? And he decided to translate Sahih al-Bukhari. Now, his father had an advantage that he did not have, which is, you know, his father knew Arabic. I mean, imagine this Chinese Muslim man who moved to California, who understands Arabic, who speaks English, who works as an engineer, and he translates. So what a legacy, right? His son, unlike his father, does not know Chinese, but he's a committed Muslim, he's a devout Muslim, and he wants to translate Sahih al-Bukhari. So he started translating from the English translation of Sahih al-Bukhari. But in order to make sure that his translation is not completely off the mark, he would constantly go to the shuyukh and the scholars to check on every word. Do I have the right understanding in English before I translate this to Chinese? And it took him 10 years. And he just recently finished the translation of Sahih al-Bukhari into the Mandarin Chinese language. And one of the very first copies, subhanAllah, after publication, one of the very first copies, copies was gifted to the Tarbiya Institute Library. Uh, and, and I have it now, and we're trying to list it, you know, to, to uh, put it in our library. You know, it's all in Chinese, but the absolute most beautiful and fascinating thing. And ever since we've been thinking about this incident, right? You know, this, this young man in his 40s who translated Sahih al-Bukhari gave access to one of the most authentic collections of hadith to hundreds of millions of, of people, hundreds of millions of Muslims who speak Chinese, but, but you know, hundreds of millions more that will have access to, to, this, uh, uh, to this particular collection of hadith through the efforts of this man. This is a life's work. This is a legacy that will outlive this man. You know, centuries from today, people will say that the very first Mandarin uh, translation of Sahih al-Bukhari came from San Jose. Hundreds of years from today, people will talk about this man as the source of that legacy, subhanAllah. And, and, and I wanted to talk about that today. Because the concept of legacy or the concept of a life's work, it's not very common, you know, among people. It's particularly not common among the Muslims. You know, we're, we're very successful in our professions, in our jobs, in our careers. We're very motivated. We're very hardworking. You know, we're, we're mostly educated people with a lot of drive, a lot of motivation. That's great, right? But a lot of people think that their job is their legacy, that their business is their legacy, that their source of income is their life's work. And while it is true sometimes that your job is your life's work, most of the time that is not true. And it does not need to be true. And the Quran actually makes that distinction. The Quran makes a distinction between a career, a job, a source of income, and a life's work or a legacy or a mission in life that will outlive you, that will stay in the world, you know, after you leave the world. I mean, if you die today, what is it that you're leaving to your kids? You can only leave them wealth or assets. If you're a doctor, you cannot leave them uh, the medical field because you cannot bequeath a certificate. 
You cannot take your engineering certificate and give it to your kids. It will be absolutely useless to your kids. You cannot bequeath a job. You cannot bestow a career upon your children. So what is it that we can leave? Most people will say, I just left money. That's it. And that is perhaps part of your legacy is to leave enough for your children to support them. But it is a very small part of that legacy. What do you leave? You leave a life's work. You leave an incredible legacy. You leave the mission of your life that inspires your children so that they say, you know what? I would like to walk in my father's footsteps. Not by, by becoming a doctor, an engineer, an attorney like my dad, but rather by a, inheriting, inheriting the legacy of my father. And I said that the Quran makes that distinction. Right? In, the, in Surah Al-Namr, in the story of uh, uh, Dawood and Sulaiman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, uh, that he has bestowed knowledge. Ilma. I have bestowed knowledge upon Dawood and Sulaiman. Wait a second. What else did Dawood and Sulaiman have? They were both what? They were both kings. Right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say, I have given them the dominions, I have given them the realm. He says, you know, that, that's their job. You know, what is your job? My job is a ruler. I rule my country. That's, that's my job. That's different. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَا دَاوُودَ وَسُلَيْمَانَ عِلْمًا وَقَالَ أَلْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي فَضَّلَنَا عَلَى كَثِيرٍ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ You know, may the Lord be praised who have elevated us above so many of his, you know, most righteous worshippers, right? Now, it says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed knowledge upon them. The next ayah says, وَوَرِثَ سُلَيْمَانُ دَاوُودَ Sulaiman inherited Dawood. If the legacy in the first ayah is the career, is being a king, then in the next ayah, Sulaiman would have said, oh yes, I inherited being king myself, I'm the heir to the throne. But what does Sulaiman actually say? Ya ayuha nasu, ullimna mantiqa tayr, wa utina min kulli shay. Oh people, I have been given the gift of understanding the articulation of birds. I can understand the language of birds and beasts when they speak to each other. Ilm. He did not even make mention of being king like his father. He said, you know, my father had knowledge and I inherited the legacy of my father, the life work of my father, which is knowledge, not being a king. Even though he did inherit, you know, being a king by, by virtue of being the crown prince of the empire, but that was not his focus. So I wanted to talk to you today about the distinction between pursuing a career and pursuing a life's work or a legacy. A career is a source of income for you. It doesn't define who you are. You know, you are a doctor, you know, for the, for the hours that you spend at your hospital. When you come to the masjid, you're not a doctor because you're not practicing medicine at the masjid. You are another Muslim community member. You're a brother. You're a sister. You're a lot more than your career. But you also see some people in the world who dedicate their life to something great, to something beautiful, to a cause beyond themselves and their immediate family, to impact the world in a, in a beautiful and inspiring way. A legacy that they can leave behind after they die and leave this world. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant each and every one of us an opportunity today. And in the summer of heroes, I wanted to talk to you about the heroism of a great figure in our Islamic history who lived the, the concept of a life's work or a legacy or a mission in life that was beyond his career and the impact was absolutely astounding reverberated in the corners of existence to this day so much is owed to the incredible work of this particular man his name is al hassan ibn ali al tusi he's known by another name but i'm i'll keep his most popular name you know as a surprise in just a few moments i'll share with you i don't want to burst the bubble yet right al hassan ibn ali al tusi and as his name suggests he is born in the city of tus which is in you know, present-day Iran. But at that time, it was part of an Afghani empire that was called the Ghaznavid dynasty. And I talked about the Ghaznavids last time when we talked about the Bayruni, right? He was part of that beautiful, thriving empire. And his father had a prestigious position you know, in the imperial court, and he was close to, to the Sultan, and so on and so forth. Now, the Ghaznavids were kind of, they gave a, a nominal loyalty to the Abbasis because they considered the Abbasis to be the Khulafa, and so even though they were completely autonomous, but they would still pray for the Abbasi Khalifa, you know, uh, on, on, on Fridays, you know, after Jum'ah. Uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the day to come again for the Ummah, for the Khatibs, for the Imams, 
to prey on the member for a Khalifa. We have been cut to pieces for about a hundred years now. And, and we cannot find that unifying Khalifa of the Muslim Ummah that we can all pray to, you know, pray for on, 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 the, on the pulpits of, of Khutbat al Jum'ah. I ask Allah to bring those days back, Allahumma Ameen. So the Ghaznavis were this powerful Afghani dynasty that, that you know, stood as a, a barrier between the Muslims and the Mongols. And they fought and they fought and they fought for decades, subhanAllah. When his father passed away, Al Hassan ibn Ali al Tusi, he also you know, was given a position. He, he became a civil administrator in the region of Khurasan, which is also in present day Iran. But something else was coming from the north. The Seljuk Turks were inching every day into the Muslim world. And the Seljuks at the time, they were Turkic people, they were Muslim. But they were mostly conquerors. They were very crude. They were very rough people. They were conquerors that happened to be Muslim. And over the next few decades, you know, piece by piece, they're nibbling away at the Ghaznavis. And they are taking parts of the Muslim world, right? And the Muslims didn't mind as much. I mean, the dynasties, of course, did put up a, a huge opposition. But the Muslims did not worry about it. As long as I'm ruled by another Muslim, it didn't really matter to most people. But at tusi Al-Hassan ibn Ali, knew that something great was going to happen. He saw something in the Turks, and he felt in his heart that those people are destined to rule. And they're going to rule the Muslims for a long time. And I don't want them to be just barbarians who happen to be Muslims. I wanted them to be true Muslims who also happen to be conquerors. I wanted Islam, the roots of Islam to be sent deeper in their hearts. And that became his life's mission. He accepted that sooner or later, the Turkish Seljuks would take over the Ghaznavi Empire. In fact, he believed in his heart that he would take over the Abbasis as well. And it was only just a decade or two when, when, the, when exactly how he predicted it, things actually went down. And eventually, the Seljuks took over all the Ghaznavi Empire and they took over the rest, most of the territories of the Abbasis as well. Now, a lot of people saw that as a threat. But Al-Hassan ibn Ali al-Tusi saw that as a huge opportunity. He said, the Turks are positioned to lead the Muslim world. And I want to make sure that Islam inspires their hearts so that they are Muslims who happen to be rulers and not rulers who happen to be Muslims. So he offered his help. And he's a, a, a well-known, prudent civil administrator. They hired him in a heartbeat. So you have this Farsi-speaking, this Iranian slash Afghani man who now works for the Turks. And he climbs up the ladder of power every day with his prudence and his intelligence and his savviness. And across his career, he meets a particular man that was a game changer. His name is Alp Arslan. And Alp Arslan was, was a commander in the Seljuk army, but Al-Hassan ibn Ali al-Tusi saw something in him and they befriended each other right away. Both are very pious men. Both are taught in the Shafi'i Madhab. Both are taught in Ash'ari thought. Both are very, very deeply religious and deeply devout and deeply committed to God. And they clicked right away. And they became partners right away. And it was through the efforts of Al-Hassan ibn Ali al-Tusi that Alp Arslan, the, the commander in the army, actually became the Sultan eventually. And when Alp Arslan became the Sultan, it was a complete game changer in the Muslim world. Now you have a deeply pious religious man with a sense of vision, who cares more about serving the deen than serving the tribe, who has a vision for, for spreading Islam across the ancient world at the time. And that partnership led Al Hassan ibn Ali al Tusi to actually become the first minister in the Seljuk Empire and came to be known as. Nidham al-Mulk. Nidham al-Mulk is the great administrator, the, the great leader, the Farsi-speaking man who served the Turks because by serving the Turks, he saw a service of Islam. He saw a service of the deen. He saw a service of the ummah. And his life's mission was how to bring the Turks to take Islam seriously so that it governs their actions and inspires their choices so that they actually do good in the world. And subhanAllah, little did he know 
that from that day, and that is about a thousand, that, that's about what, like the year 1000, right, after the common era, until the early 1900s, the Muslim world was mostly ruled by either the Seljuks or their later cousins, the Ottomans. He was right. He envisioned that. And he knew that the Turks were good enough and they have the good qualities to rule most. Of, even India was ruled by the Turks for so many centuries. He knew that for a thousand years they ruled the Muslims. And, and you know, many of you know how much I have a lot of love for the Turkish people, but that's not the point today. The point that I need to make is that these people ruled the Muslim world for a thousand years. They defended us against the Mongols. They defended us against the, the Byzantines, against the Crusaders. You know, Alp Arslan fought the, the, the Romans in this incredible battle that is called the Battle of Manzikert. A lot of people don't know that battle. It's the only time when a Muslim ruler captured alive a Roman emperor. They captured alive Romanos the fourth. They captured him alive, the only time it ever happened. And he was held in captivity for a few months by Alp Arsalan, and then he was released later for a huge ransom. Right? This is what those men did. They defended the identity of the Muslim Ummah. They defended the very core of the Muslim Ummah. They defended the Abbasi dynasty from falling apart and crumbling, and they kept it alive. And until the, the, the World War II, I'm sorry, World War I, pretty much, the Ottoman Empire was ruling the Muslim world, even if in a nominal way, subhanAllah. The vision of Nidham al-Mulk was to send the root of Islam as deep as possible into the Turkish people and through the Muslim world as well. Alp Arsalan eventually passed away, and his son Malik Shah became the Sultan. But Malik Shah is very young. So who became the de facto ruler of the Muslim Empire? Nidham al-Mulk himself. Nidham, by the way, Nidham al-Mulk needs, means order of the realm. He is literally the, 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 the organizer of the entire dominion with his efforts and his incredible work. What does he do in order to see that vision achieved? He created the one thing that we still remember him for today, which is the Nidhamiya school system. That was his life's work. That was his legacy. The Nidhamiya school system. His vision was, I need to create those incredible schools with the best teachers, with the best curricula, with the best resources, with the best funding, and create a series of them, not just one. In every capital of the Muslim world, I will create one of those schools. So the first one was in Baghdad. And he said, this is the first one, this is the headquarters, this is, this is going to set the tone, so I need to select the absolute best academic to become the dean of that school. Who does he select? Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, alayhi rahmatullah. And Imam al-Ghazali became the dean of the very first Nizamiya school. All the vision of Nizam al-Mulk. And he created another one in Damascus, and more all over the world. And gradually, students of knowledge would go at a young age. They would study all the Sunni madhahib, right? The, the, the Hanafi, uh, Shafi'i, Hanbali, and Maliki. They would even study Ismaili, Zaydi, and Ja'fari, Shafi'i fiqh as well. Even though Nidham al-Mulk himself is Shafi'i Ash'ari, but he would encourage the, the, the teachers to teach Mu'tazili thought, to teach Maturidi thought, to teach Ash'ari thought. They even taught uh, non-Islamic curriculum. They would teach Greek and, and Latin languages. They would teach history. They would teach astronomy. They would teach engineering. They would teach chemistry in order to create well-rounded students, subhanAllah. And he kept going like this and pushing for this until he was assassinated by an Ismaili assassin, subhanAllah. Like so many great men and women in history with incredible legacies, you know, they were just cut down by some deranged human being. But while Nidham al-Mulk passed away, inshaAllah ta'ala, as a shaheed, his legacy still endures today. You know, every boarding school in the world today owes its inspiration to the Nidhami system. All the vocational schools, they owe, owe it to the Nizamiya system. All the well-rounded, comprehensive school curricula owe that to the Nizamiya system. And he had this incredible waqf, this endowment, that supported the school for hundreds and hundreds of years, subhanAllah. But I know that many of you think sometimes, well, you know, these are great figures, thousand years ago, I need someone I can relate to. What can I do today, you know, in order to build a legacy or 
you know, have a life's work. Nidham al-Mulk, you know, so I can't be like Nidham al-Mulk. So I will share with you some examples from today, right? Everyone knows Elon Musk. He had a job, right? He had a career. He did like the PayPal thing. But then he had a mission. And his mission was, I need to kill the internal combustion engine. So it's a bad design. And it's been around for over 100 years. Enough is enough. I need to kill this thing. And he knows that Ford is not going to do it. He knows that General Motors is not going to do it, right? It takes a crazy person to go up against all the big corporates. So what does he do? He brings about, and he funds from his own pocket, the, 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 the electric car, the electric vehicle, and for the first time, now you're seeing the world is changing because of the vision of one man. There's a distinction between his career and you know, his life's work. And you know, don't get me wrong, and I'm, saying, I'm not saying that Elon Musk is a hero. You know, he's a person with a, with a lot of you know, bad personality traits, but that's not what we're assessing today, is it? That's not what we're examining today. We're examining the idea of someone who dedicates his life to something great. I was reading recently about this organization that is called MADD, M-A-D-D. What is M-A-D-D? Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Who started this organization? A woman by the name is of Susan Leitner. Her 13-year-old daughter in the 1980s was hit by a drunk driver and she dies. So what does she do? She, she brings all the other mothers who lost their kids to, to drinking and driving, you know, car accidents, and she creates an organization, she calls it MADD, M-A-D-D, Mothers Against Drunk, Dr Drunk Driving. And she starts collecting funds and organizing fundraisers and lobbying and applying pressure on the legislatures across all 50 states today because of that woman's legacy, I don't even know what she used to do. Maybe she worked for the county. Maybe she was an engineer. Maybe she was a teacher. Maybe she was a doctor. I don't know. And quite honestly, none of us cares. What we care about is what? Not her career, but her legacy. Today, every single American state has laws in the books against drinking and driving. We have laws in the books that determine the, the, the age of, of drinking in America in general all because of her. Even Canada, they have laws in the provincial books because of this woman. Countries in South America, they've changed their laws because of this woman. Is that a legacy or is it not? See how much it changed the world? In fact, I always I say that to my students, that what's more important than putting laws against drinking and driving is shaking the idea of alcohol in the minds of the American people. America used to think that there's something sacred about alcohol. There's something almost holy and religious. It was celebrated. Today, everyone you know, looks uh, dubiously at alcohol. Everyone in their heart of hearts know there's something wrong, that the only safe amount of alcohol consumption is zero. We know that today. And this is all inspired by a woman that decided not to sulk and cry and lament in the corner, but rather to actually do something about it. One of the greatest legacies is that of Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, and I mention him for a reason. Sultan Salahuddin, of course, his job was the king. He is the sultan, and prior to that, he was the general, right? But what was his life's work? What was his legacy? His legacy was to bring Jerusalem to the fold of Islam and to free Jerusalem from the crusaders. That was his legacy. He, for all practical purposes, he could have avoided Jerusalem and he could have marched on other, you know, safer places if it was territorial acquisition that interested him. If it was being a great king that interested him. Rather, he said no. Being a king is one thing, but if I don't do that one thing, bring Jerusalem back to Islam, then I have failed. And subhanAllah, 1187, the battle of Hattin, when he brought Jerusalem back to the fold of Islam, and he died shortly thereafter. That's it. He fulfilled his life's work, his life's mission. Why do I say Salahuddin al-Ayyubi today? Because Salahuddin was taught by great teachers who all graduated from the Nizamiya school system. Including Nuruddin Mahmoud, you know, his direct teacher and uncle. Graduates of the Nizamiya school system. A renaissance of sorts was injected into the life of the Ummah as a result of the work of Al-Hasan ibn Ali al-Tusi, Nizam al-Mulk, rahimahullah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to elevate the station of those men and women and to keep their legacies alive. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ability to walk in their footsteps, brothers and sisters. 
Raise your hands and speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the heart. Ud'u Allah wa antum muqinun bi hijab. الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين به ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له ولي مرشدا وصلي وسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وقائد الغر الميمين محمد الصادق الوعد الأمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وارض اللهم عنا معهم my dear brothers and sisters, you know, this summer, since, mashallah, we're all here, uh, most of us are not distracted by work or school, and you know, the kids are joining us as well. You know, even their moms who are you know, often uh, unable to come to Jum'ah because they have to pick up the kids from school or whatever. We figured that the best theme that can guide our khutbahs this, uh, uh, this summer is the theme of heroes. Uh, to look into the legacies of incredible men and women from our history uh, and show our kids that you don't need to be wearing a cape and, 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 and have uh, superpowers and, and say bad words and, and cause unspeakable destruction around you in order to be a superhero. You can be a superhero and learn from superheroes that actually existed, that walked this earth. Superheroes that truly impacted the world and inspired millions. And today we talk about Nidham al-Mulk, rahimahullah. Al-Hassan ibn Ali al-Tusi, uh, the great servant of the Seljuk court, uh, the friend, helper, and supporter of the great Sultan Alp Arsalan, and the founder of the Nizamiya school system, a man who truly institutionalized the idea of leaving a legacy and leaving a life's work behind you. The Nizamiya school system taught hundreds of thousands, not m millions of Muslims, but most importantly, those people became legends, they became leaders, they became kings, they became sultans, they became khulafa, they became scholars, they became mentors and teachers, and they truly, truly brought a renaissance in the Muslim world that fended off both the Mongols and the Crusaders. And I want to cite an ayah from the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُلْ اعْمَلُوا فَسَيَرَ اللَّهُ عَمَلَكُمْ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ Labor, Allah says, labor, put the effort, Allah, His Messenger, and the believers will see the fruits of your labor. Even after you die and leave the world, you leave a legacy behind, the believers will always see the fruits of your labor. And they will always make dua for you. And they will always remember you. And your kids will feel proud that they are your sons and that, that you are, they, they, they are your daughters. Do more than just focusing on your jobs and your careers and the devices by which you earn your incomes. Do more in the world than just earning money. And I want to conclude by making a couple of quick points. Number one, some legacies are not good. Not every legacy is a good thing. Not every life's work is a good thing. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? We have Facebook today or Instagram. I'm not sure if the world is a better place because we have social media, quite honestly. There's some good in social media, but, and that is entirely my subjective opinion. I think there's a lot more bad than good in social media. But that's just me, right? Not every legacy is necessarily a good legacy. Not every life's work is necessarily a good life's work, right? Point number two, subhanAllah. Some of you would think, well, what kind of life's work do I need to pick for myself? You know, I will invent the cure to cancer. Not necessarily. It doesn't have to be the most flashy thing either. It doesn't have to be earth shattering. It doesn't have to be on the cover page of the New York Times. A life's work can be the simplest, most discreet legacy. It can be you saying, I will pick five families back home and I will make sure for the rest of my life that they don't sleep hungry every, any night. That is a legacy, is it not? You can say to yourself, I will pick one youth to mentor every year. That's it. I will take one kid and I'll focus on this kid for the entire year. And then when I feel that they're on the right track, inshallah ta'ala, I'll move on to something else. Life's legacy or life's work could be something as simple as feeding the homeless. As simple as being the one that is known in your community to always keep a good, beautiful issue alive. Life's work could be about da'wah. You know, I know some brothers, dear brothers that I love so much, they go to the denials 
a, a, a farmer's market and they set up a table and they give out Qur'ans. That's life's work. You keep doing something like this consistently, something inspiring, beautiful, that impacts the world. And that's all you need to do. And the more the merrier. If you have energy to do more, then do more. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this day to keep our hearts inspired and to protect us from evil. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to defend us from the elements. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be with our children as they navigate this world for the challenges they, fee they experience are significantly worse than ours. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be with our Muslim community as we try to keep our own house in order and at the same time change our world to the better. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to honor our parents, take care of our siblings and spouses, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep Islam strong and alive in our families for thousands of years to come. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep the legacy of Nidham al-Mulk and our other heroes alive. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to inspire us and to inform us and to motivate us by those legacies. And I ask Allah as he gathered us in this shape and form to gather us in the highest level of Jannah. Allahumma ameen. Brothers and sisters, do pass the boxes. Jazakumullah khairan for your support. Uh, you can alternatively find us on Venmo uh, or uh, go to tarbiyah.org slash give. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. Fajr iqama will be at 5 a.m. and Isha is at 10 p.m. Uh, Camp Furqan uh, starting next Friday, inshallah, July 29th through August 4th. Uh, and uh, alhamdulillah, I think we passed 70 registrations so far. So we're getting very close to our maximum capacity, which is 100. Uh, and with Allah's grace, we have a, f a couple of families that decided to sponsor, uh, you know, a few uh, empty slots uh, in the camp. So if, if financial difficulty is what is preventing you from signing up, please do let us know. We might have some sponsorship for you, inshallah. And, and if you, uh, any of the parents here, if your kids are young, but you know that there are others whose kids are teenagers, like middle school or high school or college, and they could uh, uh, take advantage of this sponsorship, please spread the word and let us know, and we will give them a, a discount code that they can use, inshallah, uh, for uh, the registration process. Uh, Sunday school registration is now open, and the fall semester starts Sunday, August 16th, inshallah. Uh, our seminary open house, this is a night, a night of ilm featuring Sheikh Farhan Zubairi from IOK and Imam Sharif, the director of the Tarbiya Seminary, uh, here at THR, uh, 7 p.m., uh, Friday, August 19th, inshallah. Tarbiya giving back, feed the homeless, this is tomorrow, July 23rd at 10 a.m., uh, or if you would like to sponsor a meal, you can do that as well. Uh, flyers will be on the office manager's table. Tonight, inshallah, the Tafsira program we start at 7 p.m. and I will cover uh, Surah Al-Infithar uh, here at THR. Imam Kamran will cover uh, Surah Al-Qalam uh, in Natomas, inshallah. Uh, Tarbiyah House Natomas Soul Sisters, Tuesday, July 26th at 6.30 p.m. at THN. Uh, and Dua Books, we have beautiful uh, printed Dua Books available uh, as a gift to the community. Uh, we've had them here. I'm not sure if we ran out, but there's certainly a lot left in, 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 uh, in, in our other location in Natomas. So inshallah, if you have not taken a copy of that dua book, please inquire on your way out. Uh, some dua requests for you today. Uh, brother, um, brother Aman Zidran is requesting dua for his uncle, Brother Dawood. He was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and the oncologist has said chemotherapy is no longer working uh, and they have to discontinue his treatment. You know, such tragic news for the family, uh, subhanAllah. Brother Taymur uh, Safi is uh, requesting dua for his nephew, Khaybar Safi. He's hospitalized and is only six years old uh, and he's not doing very well. So the family is asking us to pray for them. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them both shifa. I ask Allah to show us his incredible miracles. Uh, I ask Allah to give them healing and to bring them to their families safe and sound. Allahumma ameen. I also wanted to share with you the tragic news of losing you know, our beloved Sheikh Muhammad Sharif. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you've uh, heard of it. Yesterday, subhanAllah, he passed away. He's the founder of Discover You and uh, the founder of Al-Maghrib Institute. He suddenly passed away uh, yesterday. In fact, I was literally reading a post from him. Six hours later, they posted that he died. So he posted, and, and then six hours later, you know, he passed away within that short window with no prior health issues whatsoever. He literally just dropped, subhanAllah. 
uh, you know, that this man was a giant in our community and in the Ummah. Uh, he made unparalleled strides in Islamic work, especially in the West. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his works to be a sadaqa jariya uh, for him until the Day of Judgment and for everything he taught us to be counted in the scale of good deeds with him and that Allah beautifies his reception, forgives him for his sins and enter him into al-firdaus al-a'la. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant his family patience in this difficult time. Please keep him in your dua. Allahumma ghafir lana dhunubana wa israfana fi amrina wa thabbit aqdamana wa surna ala al-qawm al-kafirin. Taqabbal minna innaka anta al-sami wa al-alim. Wa tub alayna innaka anta al-tawab al-rahim. Allahumma athirna wa la tu'thir alayna. Wa rfa'na wa la tada'na. Wa difa'anna wa la tadifa'na. Allahumma wahidu soffana wa jma'na ala qalbi atqa wahidin fina. Allahumma adkhilna al-jannata wa arina fiha wajhaka al-kareem. Fi ghayri dharra'a mudirratin wa la fitnatin mudilla. اللهم انصر إخواننا المصرعفين في المشارق والمغارب يا رب العالمين اللهم أبدلهم من بعد خوفهم أمنا يعبدونك لا يشركون بك شيئا اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات المسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك السميع قريب مجيب الدعوة